You got quiet too soon. Keep talking. Not you can now be quiet. Not soon. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hello. We need three volunteers. That's my line. Sorry. That's fine. We need three volunteers. <laughs> so, one, come on up. We have one volunteer. Do we have volunteer number two? Number uh, we have another hand and another one. All right. Perfect. All right. Take your hands and bring the rest of you with them. Come on up. Emily? All right. Uh, we it is are, now your lines. It is my lines. Those were mine before, but that's fine. I could try. I'm going to have y'all stand over here, if that's all right. Because we're going to play a little game called Words to the Wise. So the rules of the game are pretty simple. We're going to hold up a f famous cliche that comes from a popular literary work. And you have to choose from three options where the cliche originated. So you'll have two guesses to pick the correct option. The first guess gets two points if you get it right. If you get it right on the second guess, you get one point. OK, that is a great profile, but face the crowd, people. And if you get it right in the third guess, you there actually you didn't go. get it right. So because there's only three, so it was process of elimination. And can I have each of your names, please? First, first name. First name. Susan. Great. Susan or Sue? Your name, please. Marcel. Marcel or Sue? <laughs> and your name. Tim. Perfect. I'm gonna leave you hanging, okay. All right. The first cliche. Pot calling the kettle black. And we've got Claude Pot who's calling the kettle black. Don't remember. And your options are number one, Medea by Euripides. Number two, Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes. Or number three, The Tempest by William Shakespeare. And, and this is for Susan, correct? Oh, yeah, because we didn't figure out how we are going to play this game. This is for Susan. <laughs> that wasn't in the rules. Sue? Yes. Zen? <laughs> See what I did there? Oh, up, 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 up. Into it. Uh, number two. Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes is correct. Two points to Susan. Two points for Susan. <laughs> okay, this is for Marcel. Albatross around your neck. Albatross, neck. Albatross around your neck. Number one, The Rime of the Ancient Mariner by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Number two, The Tale of the Genji, T-A-L-E, Tale of the Genji by Murasaki Shikubu. Number three, Henry IV, Part Two by William Shakespeare. Tale of the Ancient Mariner? Well, 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 it's actually the oh, rhyme of the ancient mariner, judges. Oh, uh, well, that's close enough. We we'll, don't care. we'll give it to him. <laughs> okay. We'll give it to him. <laughs> it's, it's certainly multiple choice. I have the microphones, that's actually. That was your choice. That was your choice to give me the microphone. I have a microphone, too. Okay. We all have microphones. All right. So, Tim, <laughs> your option, I mean, your cliche is add insult to injury. And your options are The Bald Man and the Fly by Phaedrus, 1001 Nights by Anonymous, or Titus Andronicus by William Shakespeare. There's a lot of great sounds in those <laughs> options. Oh, hang on, hang on. Shout it out, shout it out. I would say Titus Andronicus, but. Um... <laughs> that is incorrect. But you get another. Attempt at a guess. I'll reread oh, the option. Oh, oh, you can steal from yourself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, add insult to injury comes from either The Bald Man and the Fly by Phaedrus or 1001 Nights by Anonymous. Well, I've never read either one. So, The Bald Man and the Fly? That is correct. Okay, so I think you got you got it's one tight, point instead of two, according to uh, yeah, it is tight. Um, 
Emily, can you give Round us a number score? Round number two. Okay. okay, no scores. Okay, Sue, Zen. Not to put too fine a point on it. That's your cliche. Not to put too fine a point on it. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Damas. <laughs> Bleak House by Charles Dickens. Or A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare. That is correct. Uh, I didn't even get to make jokes. She's good. She's good. Okay. All right. Marcel. In a nutshell. That's the cliche. In a nutshell. <laughs> is it from, one, The Second Funeral of Napoleon by William McPeace Thackeray, two, The Lives of the Most Eminent English Poets by Samuel Johnson, or Othello by... William Shakespeare. Shakespeare. We're going to have a sing-along after this. I'll say... a fellow. <laughs> all right. So we I hear that all the time at work. It's just... It's just <laughs> <laughs> so your remaining options for In a Nutshell. The Second Funeral of Napoleon by William Makepeace Thackeray or The Lives of the Most Eminent English Poets by Samuel Johnson. I'm sorry, that is incorrect. Uh, you're, you're all winners to me. Okay, ready for your final, your final question? Forever and a day. Number one. Forever and a day. Number one. Twelfth Night by... As You Like It by... William Shakespeare. Tame Over the Shrew by... William Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> Someone in the audience yeah. just won no. the whole game. Yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> I've just been working my way through Shakespeare and I've read them all. He's just been reading all of Shakespeare, folks. I just don't want you to miss that. Go ahead. <laughs> the one I couldn't read was Othello because Iago just made me sick to my stomach. But uh, let me see. Um, I can't remember well, where it was. As you like it, Taming of the Shrew. And what was the quote again? Forever and a day. Forever and a Forever day. And a day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll try Taming of the Shrew. That's correct. All yeah, right. <laughs> All right. So a final point tally. We have four for Susan, two for Marcel, and three for Tim. Susan, you are our winner. You get a big bag of books. A big a bag, giant of books. bag of a books. A really big bag of books. But everyone is a winner here. So, so you are not going home empty-handed. Consolation prizes, so please. Consolation prizes are really good books. Also really good books. Yes. Amazing Thank books Thank you for all playing. <laughs> I don't know, Emily. The heat is on tonight. We got a full house, and I really feel like we need to hit this one out of the park. Amy, I am on cloud nine. I mean, look at the crowd. It's a dream come true. We, we just need to put our best foot or feet forward. I have high hopes for the evening. Let's get this show on the road. Yeah, enough beating around the bush. I think it's time to let the cat out of the bag. You mean the jig is up? Yes, Amy. It's time to give a warm welcome to our audience, our sitting ducks for November 3rd, which is, of course, National Cliché Day. And now, live, live from, from Bethesda. Bethesda. That's it. That's you. You're done. <laughs> That's good. Oh. Okay. Who are you? So. Uh, 
Who am I? I am Amy Freeman. I am the development department, and I am made of money. <laughs> I'm made of money. These don't throw well at all. Oh my gosh, this didn't go well at all. We I am have made help. of money. We have help. Throw them, throw them, cloth. They, they, they just don't so, throw. So I'm just going to really quickly point out that I was I was rebuked for my suggestion of taking dollar bills from petty cash and throwing real money at you. So you can blame them for not getting paid tonight. So that probably would have thrown a little better. But yes. okay, so I am made of money. The writer center is not. It, in the drinks room, to which you are welcome all the time, there are Venmo, PayPal, and cash options. Um, wait, but that was my introduction? Okay. I think so. So Amy Freeman, made of money. Yeah. Yeah. I will hand off to Emily. I'm Emily. Pardon my trunk. I'm the elephant in the room tonight. Thank you. And I'm also the editor of Poet Lore, published twice a year here at the Writer Center, America's oldest poetry journal. And then we have Claude. <laughs> when life gives you lemons. We've, <laughs> we've got Margaret, our director, the big cheese in the back. Woo, for the big cheese! And we've got Lacey leading a horse to water. <laughs> Zach, what are you supposed to be? Where's your costume, dude? You didn't even dress up. I'm clearly tooting my own horn. Ah. Uh, <laughs> That's the reaction we want. <laughs> oh, you've seen it all before, have you? I don't know. Someone, if you have a cliche, you can just throw them out. Yeah. Um, I'm disappointed but, no. by the lack of costumes. Just can't yeah. Yeah, tell just, you, you know, Yeah, just. But if you want to beat a dead horse, go ahead. So, um, okay. So my announcement is that there are drinks and snacks and places to give money, as well as places to buy books in the other room. This isn't a reading where you need to sit politely. I mean, you can, but you know why. Um, so jump up anytime and grab a drink. Get one for me. Oh, Steph. Steph with the lights. <laughs> Two years running. OK. <laughs> go, 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 stand. OK. Uh, just for the record, she specifically said, no, that one was supposed to stay on, but whatever, uh, <laughs> that she wasn't going to do that this time. Like, that was a conversation before this like event, 20 and it minutes, has 20 occurred. Minutes ago is Old I'm not habits <laughs> die hard, am I right? Uh, see, there we go. Hey, you know what? All's well that ends well. <laughs> oh! This isn't even the scripted part. Hard, hard to teach an old dog new ah. tricks. There we go. That's what we want. We want that terrible energy. Okay, so anytime, grab a drink. Give money, buy books. Um, books are provided by loyalty bookstores. We love them. Please support our authors this evening. Thank you. I'm done. Me too. Welcome <laughs> to the Writer Center okay. and to the Writer Center Live. Well, real quickly, I think we have a, a weather warning coming in. It's um, raining cats and dogs. Keep your hands up. Oh, God, we hit someone in the head right away. Hands up. All right. Okay. Enjoy your cats and dogs. We're sorry for the person we hit in the head. All right. I'll, I'll, We're mostly I'm sorry. Amazing. They're very soft. <laughs> Keep those things. Just shout them out. All right. Never gets old. I think it's time to get to some readings. So we had a little bit of a shuffle. One of our readers could not make it, but at the Writer Center, we are never short of writers or readers. So I'd like to invite Claude, when life gives you lemons, up to the stage. Let me move my trunk. <laughs> Hello, Emily. Hello. Hello. Oh, this is beautiful. Hi, everybody. Sorry. All right, Claude. Who the heck are you? Who am I? Uh, my name's Claude Olson. I'm the office manager here at the Writers' Center. Uh, <laughs> I may, may have met some of you before. I've been here for about a year, you know. I'm always here for a party here at the Writers' Center. You know, I write. I, uh, you know, I sit at the front desk. You do all the things. I do all the things. All right. Yes. In honor of Cliché Day, what's one of your 
favorite phrases? Well, of course, when life gives you lemon, you make lemonade. But also, uh, I recently got a new tattoo. I promise this is not in honor of the Writer's Center. This was not part of this event. My own separate thing, but I did get it a few days ago. Burning the candle at both ends. So oh, look at I that. do like that one as well. It's beautiful. <laughs> That's the yes. official cliche of the Writer's Center. <laughs> yes, uh, it is. Absolutely. We actually all have them. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's our little secret pact. All yep. right, last thing before we can hear your poem. Yes. Could you recommend a book? For us. Can I recommend a book? Any book. Any book. I know you asked me this advance, and now I'm going blank <laughs> of any books. That never exist. read a book before. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> never read one at all. Um, let me see. I really love the book uh, How to Write an Autobiographical Novel, which is not actually a novel. Oh. It's by Ex Alexander Chi. It's a book of essays. It's kind of a memoir. It's uh, I find it pretty cool. It's a lot of things, and it's, it's beautiful. Yes, all right. Well, yes. I'm going to leave you to it. Claude, right. everyone. Hello. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So the piece that I'm going to read for you tonight, um, it's a little bit funny because uh, this piece actually was recently published in a book, um, a book called uh, Awakenings, um, Stories of Bodies and Consci Consciousness. It's this essay collection about people who have individual experiences with bodies and minds that are different than societal norms. I was supposed to be at a reading for it next week, and I couldn't make the reading, so I'm going to talk to all of you instead. Uh, <laughs> yes, so um, it's actually an essay, but it kind of sounds like a poem. It can be whatever you want. Uh, my essay is called, My Body is a Language That I Cannot Speak. So I guess I will read that now. It's in numbered paragraphs, so I'm going to shout out some numbers. So, one, I have begun to suspect that this world is not my own. Or perhaps, more accurately, this body I possess is somehow otherworldly. It is a spectacle unto itself, able to draw an audience without a promise of performance. Passing strangers stare at it as it walks by. Some take photos to prove what they have seen. I suddenly find myself on display before a crowd of gawking anthropologists. No one tells them to stop tapping on the glass. Two, and yet there is no other world I can claim to be from. I was born in American suburbia, raised among humans who look nothing like me. To them, I have a genetic mutation, a typo in my DNA, a body, and an alternate spelling. This renders me disabled by one-sided comparison. My arms and legs are disproportionate to my torso. My height is far below average. But what if they as in all of you, are the dis disproportionate ones, towering two feet over my head. What if everyone who thinks I am a dwarf is really a giant? What if I wasn't always the oddity? Three, a young boy sits next to me on the metro. He cannot be older than seven, but no one seems to be watching him. The child is perplexed by me, by the fact that we are the same height, yet I am clearly an adult. He glances down at my legs, noticing how they bow like a pair of crescent moons. What happened to you, he asks. I am not sure how to respond. I, too, am searching for the answer. Four, how can I explain life inside a paradox? I have achondroplasia, a rare condition that can be found in every corner of the world. There are people with bodies like mine across every ethnicity, country, and social class. We all share a mutant gene, yet we are not related by blood. If not for that one bit of DNA, we would look like a random sample of the human race. There is no family tree to connect us, no shared point of origin. Each of us is an ordinary alien. Together, we are without a home planet. Five. What is it like to live in a world where every body is like your own? Any world filled with bodies like mine is an entirely fictional realm. Think about the munchkins, the Oompa Loompas, and the seven dwarves. Imagine watching a film, seeing a country full of caricatures, people with bright green hair, garish makeup, bodies that are comical because they are too ridiculous to exist. Now, imagine your body looks more like those than almost any in the real world. Would you begin to wonder, too, if you are fantastical? I must remind, oh, six. I must remind myself that somehow we are everywhere. There are 30,000 little people in the United States and 650,000 across the globe, but those are merely numbers. All I can prove is that there are two, me and my mother. Number seven, I imagine her as an ignorant child sitting inches away from the television set, transfixed by the Wizard of Oz. As Dorothy wakes up in a technicolor world, I picture my mother's eyes growing wide. Did she realize her world would soon change just as drastically? Did a flicker of recognition pass across her face as the munchkins led Dorothy down the yellow brick road? Then I remember, she grew up with a black and white TV in a town where the roads were not yellow, only varying shades of gray. Eight, before me, my mother was the only little person on the family tree. For most of her childhood, she was unaware of this. No one told her that she was any different, that she acquired a spontaneous mutation, or that she wouldn't grow up in the same way most everyone else does. Her body was both a rarity and an open secret. She must have spent her childhood looking up at ceilings, believing she'd one day touch them. She must have waited patiently for her growth spurt to hit and noticed that every, everyone else was growing faster than she could keep up with, that the ceilings continued to be out of reach. She must have woken up one day with a startling revelation. She was unlike anyone she had ever met. Nine, I think about how my grandparents hid my mother's disability for a decade and I wonder, is there something about our bodies we should be ashamed of? 
Does the truth of our skeletal fate bar us from a happy, peaceful life, or at least a normal one? Or would it be easier if we did not know we were always, I, was not, I did not plan this, but would it be easier if we did not know we were always the exceptionally small elephants in the room? Mmm. <laughs> Unintentional. I wrote this six months ago. Uh, <laughs> Ten. My mother was born an emperor, convinced that she wore beautiful clothes. I was born completely aware of the fact that I was naked. Eleven. How can I explain being raised inside a paradox? My mother never hid the truth about my body, yet she was unknowingly telling a different sort of lie. She believed my body was a perfect replica of her own. I assumed whatever I'd have, you'd have, she, te she tells me. We both thought we were a world of two when we, were really still f we really still floated in our own separate orbits. At 16, I discovered the world found me deformed. My body was its own open secret. My mother was first to realize that we were no longer mirror images. While she was slim and straight as a scented body could be, I was heavy and meandering, curvy because of both my weight and my bones. My mother chose not to, not to tell me what was happening. She found someone else to break the news. 13, that afternoon in the orthopedic surgeon office, comes back to me like a dream. A stranger and my mother in the same room, no one acting as they should. When we arrived, the surgeon asked me to take off my pants. My mother did not object. I begrudgingly stripped down to my faded yellow underwear, and I walked back and forth with a man I had just met. I stared at the, yeah, it was fun. Um, I stared at the tile floor, so I did not have to see him study my naked legs. He wanted an x-ray of them, too, and asked me to stand against a wall. It felt like he was taking my mugshot. I wondered what I had done wrong. Uh, 14. It was then that I realized my mother and I were entirely different creatures. She was a human who just happened to be short. I was an alien who couldn't resemble anything but a freak. 15. In the x-ray, my legs glowed with blue moonlight, bending like a set of parentheses around an empty afterthought. For a moment, I allowed myself to find them beautiful. The doctor pointed at my bones with his pen, emphasizing their curvature as if it wasn't already obvious. There is the option of cosmetic surgery, he said. This is what I heard. Under your skin, there is an ugliness that does not belong in this world. My bones were whole, but just then I felt entirely broken. 16. What happened to you? 17. Nothing, in the end. We backed out of the surgery when we realized it would not be worth the price, the pain, or the physical therapy. I simply had to live with the fact that I couldn't be fixed. 18. Or maybe there wasn't anything I needed to change. I kept walking in my lilting way, slowly realizing I am no more strange than my onlookers. What if I am not the oddity? 19. Perhaps our beauty is the open secret. People can see our alien forms and believe they have made a rare discovery. Once a man approached my mother at a bar. Has anyone ever told you you're beautiful? She laughs when she tells me the story. My mother is well aware that she is a glorious technicolor spectacle. And this is the last one. 20. Since leaving suburbia, I have discovered my own body's beauty for myself. I moved to Washington and left behind the need to conform. Now I am a creature in a vibrant city. Strangers often come up to me, stare deeply into my eyes, and tell me I am beautiful. I know that they, they mean this as a revelation, but I still take it as a compliment. I have shown them another world. No, an entire universe of possibility. Thank you very much. I'm now going to invite Amy to the stage. It's time for Amy's Funnies! I do keep a keyboard here specifically to play a diminished chord when Amy takes the stage. Just this so you happened. Know. You know, I walk in in the morning and I get <laughs> this. It's, it's fine. As a writer, I avoid cliches like the plague. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a little pitter patter. Is it raining? Cats and dogs, this time keep your head up. Heads up! Heads up! <laughs> Cats and dogs incoming. Try not to let them the lamps. Oh, I can see Sam, Sam Ashworth. You're like this six-year-old just... <laughs> <laughs> Donation jars in the other room, Sam. Yeah. <laughs> um, Shannon Sanders, come on down. Woo! Oh. I forgot, sorry. 
Hi, everyone. Hi. Hello. So, um, Shannon. Amy. Let's just <laughs> have a moment. <laughs> Who the heck are you? Who am I? Um, I am an attorney. I am a debut. Oh, oh, same, same, oh. same. Oh, really? Okay. Former. Uh, former. Former. Recovering. Yeah. <laughs> current suffering. Um, <laughs> I am a debut author, so company, my linked short story collection is, is, um, is one month old today. It came out on October 3rd of this year. I'm really excited about it. Um, can, we, can we buy it in the room next door and write glowing reviews on Goodreads and the Devil, Amazon? Yeah, yes, you can, and I hope that you do. Yes, I would love for you to. Um, and I'm a mom of small kids, and they have gifted me with some lingering something, so I'm going to read for as long as my voice will let me, and then I will decide when my throat's going to give out. And, and, and I, I found out today from Twitter that you started at the Writer Center. I sure did. This yeah. was Writer not Center a plug baby. for the Writer Center. Writer we didn't Center know. Yeah. yeah can, this is exciting. Yes. Yep. This, is, this was the home of my very first like five workshops that I ever took. Maybe all the workshops I've ever taken, but three of them. So... Yeah. Welcome home. Yes, thank you for having me. There's no place like home. That's right. There's no place like the Writer Center. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, okay, so for Cliché Day, uh, yeah. what, what, what's one of your favorite tired uh, phrases? Sure, I guess I'm going to go with you miss all the shots you don't take, which is Perfect. something I kind of learned actually in this building. Um, I, you know, I started to navigate all of that, the fun of submitting, rejection, submission, rejection, all of that. And ultimately, you know, I think that, that that cliche has been really helpful to me in pushing through that and just continuing to send things out. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt for a second because Zach is giving me stage directions. I was asking to turn up, lift the microphone on the podium subtly. Me, sure. Can you hear me? How's that? Okay. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Okay. <laughs> do I need I can, do this, I can do this all day, people. Okay. We'll, have this, we'll have this worked out for International Mime Day, but not for Cliché Day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, did we finish our discussion? I think so. I don't okay. Need, so oh, please, oh, recommend a okay. book. Recommend a book. Recommend a book. Uh, yours, yours is good, but um, we just talked about that. So. Thank you. Yeah, okay. I'm going to go with another short story collection that I love and that I return to um, when I want to just get excited about writing because the sentences are so fun and you can just feel the writer having fun with every single story in it. It's um, Lisa Taddeo's Ghost Lover, which is a short story collection, not linked, and I believe it was released in 2022. Ghost Lover, yeah. I have to sit down now. All right. So I think I am going to, in honor of Cliche Day, I'm gonna read from a story that was generated um, <laughs> <laughs> Not by AI, um, but from a prompt that I got at a workshop in the Writer Center, the very first one I ever, um, I think, wrote for a workshop, the first story I ever had published, and that appears in Company. Um, it's called Rule Number One, and it involves a mother sort of, uh, you know, depositing cliches into her daughters before her passing, um, and just trying to make sure that they're aware of things that she thinks they will need to know in little bite-sized cliche forms. Um, like I said, I'm going to just read until my, my voice gives out, so I hope I can get to a good section break at the very least. Um, so this is the beginning of rule number one. Always have your shoes rehealed before they really need it. Don't wait till they wear down to the noisy, clicking nubs and turn cacophonous on hard surfaces. Go with the very first sign of rubber erosion while the last reheal job still looks practically new. Forget about cheating, hoping to stick to places with carpet. There are surprise hard surfaces everywhere, such as every elevator and public bathroom on the planet, and unless you plan ahead, you'll be caught at all the worst times. So it's worth planning ahead, worth what it costs you in cobbler's fees. Why? Because it seems like a little thing, but it's exactly the kind of little thing that distinguishes a person who has her life in order from one who's about to fall right off the edge. A person wobbling around on clicking heels probably has all sorts of issues she's not tending to. And maybe you do too, but the last thing you need is to walk around broadcasting that to people two blocks away, said my mother. This was when she was telling me everything she could think to tell me right as it occurred to her. 
For this, she came into my room after she'd already tucked me in for bed, showing me a tiny dent in the coal black heel of one of her work pumps. You see this, she said, this little dent? Tomorrow I'm taking these to get the heels redone. Let me tell you about rule number one. Another day, she found me at the kitchen table, practicing my cursive letters, and invited me to touch the sleeve of one of her nice coats. This, what you're touching, is called suede, she said, pressing it to the side of my face. What I want to tell you about suede, she said, is that it doesn't belong in the rain. Rain ruins suede. It'll make it ugly, okay? Okay, I said. I have to practice my cursive. Another day still, she grabbed my collar just before I climbed out of the Volvo for school. Let's listen to this song, she said, turning up the volume on the car radio. It was the Four Tops, one of them singing about feeling like the hand sewn into his girlfriend's glove, about wanting to kiss the ground she walked on. My mother sang along with the song, moving her lips but not making any noise. She pressed her forehead to mine and then pulled it away. This man is singing to a woman he loves, she said. What do you think about that? I don't know, I said. I don't like when boys talk about kissing. I don't really like this song. Okay, said my mother. Just remember it for later. Rule number one is you don't want to have anything to do with any boy who wouldn't sing about you that way. Don't go near him unless he would kiss the ground you walk on. For the, those last few months, she did that all the time, dropping one tiny lesson after another into my head like marbles. She could find me anywhere in the house. Let me teach you how to iron, she said, clutching the iron in her fist as I crouched with my sister behind the dollhouse in the playroom. Once I heard her do it to daddy. Micah, let me talk to you, she said, in exactly the same voice she had used earlier that day to tell me about smoothing down my baby hairs with a toothbrush. She was holding the necklace he'd bought me that week, a series of bright blue pony beads on a length of yarn. When you buy one of the girls a necklace, she said, you have to buy them both a necklace. He was eating his breakfast, a plate of scrambled eggs, and his fork paused over the eggs in freeze frame as he stared at her. I bought it because Bellamy loves little necklaces, he said. I just saw it out somewhere and I thought of her. I know, said my mother, but there are two of them. That means you have to buy two necklaces. Aubrey is four, said Daddy. She couldn't care less. That doesn't mean you don't buy her a necklace, said my mother. Maybe it means you buy her the necklace and show it to her and tell her that when she's a big girl like Bellamy, you'll let her start wearing it. You either give her the necklace or give her something to look forward to. As she said this, she shook the beads a little bit like dice. Daddy set his fork down on the table, still with pieces of egg attached to it. You're upset, he said. Aubrey is little. You put a necklace on her and she pulls the damn thing off in two seconds. You need to listen to me, said my mother, a little loudly, leaning forward. If you give her a necklace and she throws it right in your face, then that's the situation and you deal with it. But rule number one is if you have two daughters and you buy two necklaces, whether they're thir or th four or 34, I am right about this and it's something I don't want you messing up. Suze, said daddy, Susie girl. He pulled her close. He'd stayed seated as she stood over him with the necklace so that when he put his arms around her, his face smushed into the fabric of her A-line dress. I never saw him kiss the ground, but I could almost imagine him doing it. I mean it, Micah, said my mother. She'd made her voice soft again. I don't remember making any noise, but they both looked right over then to see me watching wide-eyed from the playroom, my sister kicking and then biting the backs of my legs to recapture my attention. Before that, it had been months since either of them had used adult words in front of us or even spoken anything but the sweetest tones like characters on after-school sitcoms. Well, all right, said my mother, nodding me over. She opened her fist and dropped the necklace into my outstretched hand. It's yours. Enjoy. There were rules for everything, each one singularly important. Marbles falling ever faster, plunk, plunk, plunk. I started writing them down in my birthday journal, taking every chance to work on my cursive. There were rules for school. Try your best. Always do the extra credit. Stay after class to ask questions, even if you got it the first time. Rules for company. Mop the foyer beforehand. It's all right if your guests dirty it up with their outside shoes, but the floor should sparkle right up until that happens. Serve yourself last in your own house. 
Keep the powder room clean at all times, just in case someone drops by. Always have a bed made up with good linens on it for guests. But wait a minute, I said when she told me that one. What if someone drops by and you don't have the bed made? Well, that's what I'm telling you, she said. You just make sure you do. But on that subject, don't you ever drop in on anyone like that. I guess we could call that rule number two. Rules for the body. Drugstore lotion is good enough for arms and legs, but you need Vaseline or cocoa butter for your heels. Heels are just different that way. Brush your teeth like this, your hair like that, and others that didn't make sense at the time, but would a few years later when I was more woman than girl. Rules that didn't fit into any other category, that got their own pages in my journal. Try to make people feel good about being around you. Happy, comfortable, unafraid. It'll make your life easier. Always look out for your sister. Always, always look out for your sister. She won't always want you to, but do it anyway, even then, especially then. Keep a few plants around the house. Also, a good bottle of brown liquor. I'll stop there. Thank you. So, Emily. Sorry, Amy's grabbing all my stuff. This is mine. It says Amy right there. We're a well oiled, practiced show, in case you have noticed. We did rehearse. We did, but not very well, apparently. So, Emily, we've been talking a lot about boring, cliched language today. We have. And yet, the Writer Center publishes Poet Lore, of which you are the editor. I am. What, what is Poet Lore, just for those who may not know in the audience? Poet Lore is America's oldest poetry journal. No. It looks like this. Sometimes different colors, but the same size every time, hopefully. Um, we do two print issues a year, and each issue is guest edited from a select um, poet who will curate uh, about half of the issue on a special theme. Yeah. So I think we're going to read some yeah, right. non-cliche language, just to mix it up a bit, All refresh right. our palettes. Yeah, and this is from the current issue. Uh, there'll be another issue coming out not too long in the future. I'm going to read a... They can, in fact, buy a copy or subscribe to Poet Lore, which comes out twice a year. So please uh, see us about that or go to poetlore.com, hopefully. Yes, barring the security issue, <laughs> poetlore.com. Just click on that. We're making a new website right now. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read a poem by uh, Sophia Fay, and it is Everyone Calls Me Their Husband. But no one is next to me when I wake up from the nightmares. Briefly, I consider the possibility of being a third in a relationship, not to have sex with anyone, but maybe to hold hands with two people who adore me. After pondering on that more, I realize that just means I want parents, which unfortunately checks out. Taylor says when I'm really upset, I avoid the question and make a lot of jokes, but Taylor, have you seen the weather? It's raining in LA. I've been laughing so much these days. Sophia Ooh. Fay. And I believe the Taylor in that poem is the poet Taylor Bias. What? Who we just talked to last we week. We had a craft chat with last week. Yeah, look and at has, that. Yeah. And Full has, circle moment. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to read a brief poem by Harriet Mullen from the guest edited folio by the poet Shayla Seabree. Somewhere, someone whose rumpled coat hangs anonymous in shadow, looking abandoned. If I sit across the table from no one but myself, who am I? Still wearing a hat indoors, considering the price of chop suey in a restaurant somewhere in a city full of lonely people. Snaps. And now for more poetry. Can we have Thea Brown come to the stage? Hi. 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 Thank you, Zach. All right, Thea, who are you? 
Big question. Who the heck am I? Who the heck are you? Uh, my name is Thea Brown. I live in Baltimore. I write poems. This is the book I'm going to read from today. Woo. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I live around here. I teach at George Washington. That's it. I Good I, stuff. I have some cats. I don't know. That, you should have <laughs> led with that. We love cats. I love them too. <laughs> All right. What's your favorite or kind of most used phrase? I was thinking about this for a while. Um, I think I say first things first a lot mm. in my head when I'm talking to myself, <laughs> trying to organize my day. Uh, or holy moly. <laughs> holy moly. That's a great one. Does it have a big like <laughs> emphasis or just like a subtle? No, it's really holy usually moly. like under my breath. Like holy moly. I, I was hearing it in a Midwestern accent, just to be fair. <gasps> I can't really do a Midwest. I could try. I lived yeah. in Wisconsin for a little while but I can't do it. <laughs> Could you recommend a book for us? Yes, this I do have an answer for. I'm going to recommend a novel called The Prospectors by Ariel Janikian. It is a brand new novel set in the Yukon. Ariel's a fabulous writer, and she is reading at Politics and Prose tomorrow at 5 p.m. She's in conversation with my husband, Nate Brown, who is an excellent fiction writer and uh, works at American Short Fiction, which is a great journal. But Ar Ariel Janikian, The Prospectors, it's a fabulous novel. Perfect. So go straight from this event to that one tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I'll let you read now. Thanks. I'm so happy about a drum roll. <laughs> it's really exciting. Usually exciting things don't happen at poetry readings. Um, I'm going to read from Loner Forensics, which is my newest book. It came out in May of this year. I'm going to keep it short, but... The book is uh, its a project book, which is new for me, which means that the poems are all interconnected. They exist in an imaginary city that is loosely based on Baltimore. The city is experiencing disappearances. Um, things are very strange and unusual. The overarching voice of the book is a character called the detective who is interviewing other people who live in the city. There's a long initial poem that sort of sets the stage. I will spare you that here. Uh, and we'll just get straight into some of the characters. There is going to be a little bit of audience participation. If that's OK, we're going to do a choose your own adventure kind of thing. All right. First up, the annotator. The dream where, the world where, the city where, the light comes through the waking night window, golden, then blue, then violet, each its own mood. Demarcation of wellness, life, uncertainty in the absent animals one loves, asleep, whirring, blue, then rose, a cruiser menacingly lit up and silent down the alleyway, below the frame, night birds feeding all hours, seeds falling, tapping the sill, golden, then blue, separated by, fitful by, more dreams, a beast sulking away down the dashed white of the street, best chances, wet pavement, clicks, a stirring, some weather, but not a dream, something less permanent, but not quite the city, its own dream, dreams of itself, repeated in a crescent for a time, an irregular pendulum until passing we inhabitants wake. If you'd like to talk to the weather, please hold up one finger. If you'd like to talk to the forensics team, please hold up two fingers. I'm seeing mostly two and several abstentions. That's OK. <laughs> Some of us are just going with the flow. That's cool. The forensics team. In this stalled instance, the forensics team gathers, alights, disperses, regroups, arcs, examines all avenues by which it might take further flight, examines the weather, the signs, the prints for plot, finds, redacted, here, abrasion, that one, powdery substance, team members won't speak for themselves, refusing interviews. If you'd like to talk to the weather, please hold up one finger. If you'd like to talk to the mayor, please hold up two fingers. I think the mayor it is. The mayor. What was your question? My official statement, a single sprouted leaf on the stem of a withered orchid. Each idea emerges and decomposes quickly into something a lot like nothing. 
Like this rolling, disorienting fog through my tall city first, the monument tops, looming historical wartime figures, absent their heads, their swords, human property off kilter, then the bottoms of buildings so the sleeping stories up hover without knowing. The dream where overwhelming geranium, hyacinth, incense, just this side of rot, unmistakable, the hotel lobby facing the greening fountain, the concierge all aglow from it. I've rallied the public, pleaded for patience, still. Forensics wants an avenue, a series, data points, a sterile process. If I've learned anything, this mist can whiff night sweet. Can you remember? Do you, won't they, will, worry, wait, come back. It never rains near the mayoral mansion, and that meaning obliterates. Order the slush shoveled from ditch to dry ground. Call the gardener. New flowers every day. Sharp white, small mint, cat purple, vote yellow, road shoulder pink. Forensics can record, can remember, same diff, derive, rule out. Is it the grasses that memorize our two-step detective? Absent, lazy, who stop harming? They say the city brought on the disappearances, but me, I see new space for an imaginary condo complex I unquestioningly support. No one question, but a few, like we'll dismantle ourselves asking favors, yachts, my unnecessary, undesired etiquette, still blue, blue, still beautiful in the right light which follows me, my everywhere, my colossal meteor, I'm sure of it. But keep looking, detective, leave a message. If you'd like to talk to the concierge, please hold up one finger. If you'd like to talk to the palm reader, I'm trying to figure out, uh, yeah, let's say the palm reader. Concierge, one finger, palm reader, two fingers. <laughs> palm reader, let's do it. <laughs> the palm reader, are you following your nose? Hint, the story is a dream. This is more of a story, you are not are you able to understand it? You don't want your investigation burdened by moods, the you were there and you. Into this scene, you place you, you place your voice, your number one voice, your voice assertive in Monday morning meetings at the center as the solder, as a canvas, and the framing, the gesso, as the oils, the brushes, the reproductions, as the whole sticky shebang. Hint. This instance is stalled, is a song. I mean to say I don't miss myself before the silences cut through by bells, but then sometimes, just barely, I hear music outside down the avenue, and it's like, it's like your life seals up for those minutes into an underwater room of dark blues and velvet reds, amniotic maybe, but more like space, hurtling that's more like stasis, the comfort of it, the never going back. I was different in the center of me. Did I, you did, more brittle a moss or crystalline biome in that hurtling things are okay. Hint, the dream is not a puzzle. But you, why do you arrive making such sad sounds? It's true, no one ever knows when you love them. No, no one ever could. But everyone, you, listen. Everyone knows something's afoot. We'll do one more. If you'd like to talk to the forensics team again, please hold up one finger. <laughs> Sam is like team forensics. <laughs> if you'd like to talk to the amateurs, please hold up two fingers. <laughs> Sorry, Sam. <laughs> the amateurs. Coercing the palm reader the day the mountains darken, we all prepare with methods most us. Baroque boxes of many consumer materials, foils, lenses, bought and branded, and some with nothing, a squint. We look to the sky in stranger clusters, curious, unsure, and the birds keep eating seed from the suet feeder affixed to the fire escape, tapping, light clatter, the cat sleeps, curled, none of the prophesied evidence becomes, the sky darkens like a storm above the bell tower, even as a real storm that goes to worries the periphery flashing to the west. 
everywhere a dusk glows from all approaches to horizon, encircling, holding fast despite some who journeyed up to watch it bend to sphere. Essential darkness, smothered light, the gardener lays hands on a sapling, leaves quake. A dark like our silences, but none of it ungraspable, so much time between this and the next to prepare or send it out of our minds. Not like here, quaver, no shadows, lift and pull apart, and we go back to our regular business. Thank you. Ooh. This has been a great start, I think. What do you think, Amy? I think um I think we need a seventh inning stretch. Can I have our esteemed judges come up? Claude, Margaret, and Lacey. I see you, Ariel, a brand new Writer Center employee. This is your first Writer Center moment. I don't even know if I'm emphasizing the part. You're yeah, All right, Ariel, so welcome <laughs> to the Writer Center. Next year, this is you, but <laughs> in the meantime, just document our, document our genius. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, me? I think it's you. Okay. <laughs> it's always me. Okay, so okay, so uh, this is, we need your help. We are going to give you a couple of cliches, and we're going to ask you to act them out physically. Use your body, use your hands, facial expression, whatever you want. You can stand, you can sit, do not run around the room. Uh, we've got three powerful judges, judges of power, Professional judges. They literally do this every day. They do. They are the X factor of, of American idleness. Um, um, so, okay. So, so, and there are prizes. There are prizes. Prizes. That, uh, there are prizes. Prizes of actual books. Amazing prize packs. Amazing. Actually, really big stacks of excellent books, um, which you can read. Um, and so, should read. go yeah. all out. Uh, yes. Okay. So, all right. So, judges... Flex your fingers, flex your eyes, get ready. Um, okay, so you can stand, you can sit, hands face, wiggle, jiggle, don't leave your seats because, you know, we gotta, we got to have a turnover here. Um, okay. Can they be partners? What? If, if they, they could, a question from my boss says, can they be partners? And she is my boss, so the answer is well, you're yes the judge. and. <laughs> yes and. Um, so yes and. You can be partners, but you've got to get to get, got to get together very quickly. You very ready? quickly. All right. Cliche number one is get back in the saddle. Oh, uh, Steph, Stephanie, you can you lights? please turn up the lights? Yes. Yes. All right. House lights, Get back please. in Thank the saddle. You. Let's do it. Someone. <laughs> Okay. All right, get back in the saddle, people. Let's get back in the saddle. Oh, oh, we have a partner. Oh. We have a partner. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Keep it, keep PG. Keep it PG. Okay. All right. All right, judges, judges confer. Yeah. Right. Do we have a winner? We have a winner. We have a winner. And the winner. prize pack number one distributed. I'm, I'm sort of sorry and sort of glad I didn't see what you did, Sue, but okay. Oh, she had a great facial expression. Yeah. Okay, the judges <laughs> take ah. out. Okay, okay, judges. Everybody ready for number two? Um, okay, this is, this is actually my personal favorite. Eat your heart out. <laughs> Let's go, come on. All right, I see you unzipping, I see you unzipping. <laughs> Come on, come on, let's see some hustle, people. Eat your heart out. Oh, I feel like this the side room is killing you. You guys are you, you, you. Woo! There we go. <laughs> Eat your heart out. The, uh, come on. I, I, I think I, All right. Okay. Oh, oh, darn it. Oh, I missed it. I missed it. I hate I hate when I missed it. Okay. <laughs> so can, can can you Yeah. Yeah. Whoa, oh. sounds, sounds and everything. 
<laughs> okay, we, we, have a right. clear, we have a clear... We so clear for the rest of the night, we're just going to ask you to do that. No more readings. <laughs> wow, and, and maybe, maybe talk, talk a little after. We'll just, <laughs> we'll just talk. That's fine. All right. The we have, li we have li liability issues. So. <laughs> <laughs> last round. Slippery as an eel. Slippery as an eel. Oh, 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 I don't know if anyone else needs to compete. That was good. That was good. The Shakespeare guy, right. Yeah. Tim. <laughs> Do it again. A request for yeah. people who didn't see it. Do it again. Yes, we have to. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you, judges. Thank you, judges. That was, that was, um, I'm going to. Easier said than done. Ah, look at that. Beth Ann. Beth Ann Patrick, renowned writer Beth Ann Patrick. I'm sort of like doing a fake come on down, but Beth really. Beth Ann, come on. Beth Ann. You're up. Oh, there she is. Okay. <laughs> yes, clap, clap, my guys. I just want to know um, if you have any stories to tell about your earrings. <laughs> I, I was only prepared for who the heck are you. Okay, so who... No, 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 I, I... Okay, true story. These earrings, as I told Amy when I walked in tonight, I had to have because they were marked down <laughs> from $500 to $19. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Margaret. Claude's now the executive director of the Writer <laughs> Center. So, yes, that is the true, true story. Nordstrom Rack. Who knows? Who knows? Um, <laughs> Beth Ann. Hi, Amy. Who the heck are you? Um, I am a flaneuse, a, an eminence grise. Um, I'm not sure. I guess I'm a, I'm a writer, and I haven't done a whole lot of readings, and so I'm really excited to be here, but also... Well, I, I speak French, and I don't know what you said. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. qu'est-ce qui se passe ici? <laughs> en anglais, s'il te plaît. Où est Sylvie? À la piscine, mais... À la piscine. Amy, that, Amy. Fromage. <laughs> no, that's right. Okay. That's okay. right. Okay. Um, that would be Margaret. <laughs> the big, the big fromage. La okay. grande fromage. La grande fromage. Le grand fromage. Okay. 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 All right. Enough. Enough. Enough of the bad oh. French. Sorry. Um, oh. Wait. What did I miss? <laughs> Cut the cheese. <laughs> Cut the cheese. Well, don't. Um, okay. So uh, for cliche day, what's your favorite? What's your favorite hackneyed phrase? Um, well, I think I have to go with in the pink. Thank you, thank you. Very Barbie, very Barbie, <laughs> very Barbie. Um, and can you please recommend a book? I'm going to recommend a book that I just wrote up for the... I, the Bible. <laughs> that's right. Um, I've read all of Shakespeare, and I'm on my... <laughs> 500th time of reading the Bible cover to cover. No. Um, so it used to be called the NPR Book Concierge, but I guess it's called Books We Love now instead. So anyway, I just wrote up this book for this year's NPR Books We Love, and it is called The End of Drum Time by Hannah Pilvainen, who is writing about a an ancestor, it's based on one of her ancestors, who was a fundamentalist Christian minister who went to um, Lapland, or Sami territory, in what is now Finland. And his daughter falls in love with a reindeer herder. And they have a pretty, they have a, it's amazing for such a cold place, they have a pretty hot little affair going on. But, you know, um, Mad Lasse, the father, is not happy about this at all. It's a pretty great book. 
It's pretty great. Really, really amazing um, writing. And it is definitely one of those books that shows you how relevant it is when people who have very rigid ideas try to take over from people who actually inhabit where they live. Not that I'm talking politics. Right, I was like, I, I like uh, my brain just went, stop, stop, don't say anything, please. Yeah. <laughs> so, what am I doing now? Reading. Oh, reading. oh, okay. Reading my work. Uh, yes, Amy's work. I'm gonna pretend it, that will make it easier for me, actually. <laughs> anyway, um, I wanna say two quick things. One, um, please support Loyalty Books. I do not work for them. <laughs> but I love them. You don't have to buy my book, okay? But buy the other books, buy all the swag, buy everything you can. They really need our support right now. So um, that is my hope and wish for you. Um, my book that is out right now is my debut memoir. It's called Life B. And I'm not gonna read to you from that, no. It's not at all. I'm gonna read to you from Something I've been working on for several years, I worked on it in one of Mary Kay Zaravlev's um, novel TDC workshops. We all love Mary Kay, yes. So this is from a novel I've been working on called Flirtation Walk about a military family. Um, it starts in the 1970s and moves forward in time. and. They're um, a well-known military family, but I'm not going to um, you know, pound on that right now. I'm just going to tell you that we're at a scene where the main character, Ellen Eggles, knows she has multiple sclerosis, and she and her family are stationed at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Her son, Gil, is 17 years old, and it's a weekday evening, and it's a combination of homework and taking care of his mom and watching some Jeopardy. So here we go. I hope it all makes sense. Um, in 1997, Fort Leavenworth, Gil Eggles is sitting at a dining room table, puzzling his way through his junior year calculus midterm review and stealing anxious, glasses, anxious glances at his father, who is clumsily moving around the too small kitchen preparing a tray for his mother. Other parts of the house, like the porch, the master suite, and the dining room, are almost too big. The houses on post for higher ranking officers were built during a time when no one cared much about whether or not the hired cook had enough elbow room. His mother, Ellen, remains in bed, due both to her still poor vision and crushing fatigue. Gil knows, because his parents have told him, that his mother's recovery from this bout of MS is critical. If her body can't get enough rest, it will have a tougher time producing enough myelin to help her nervous system continue to function. He watches his father, who is having an intense phone conversation with, who else? A colleague from the Combined Arms Center. Jack, the father, slops some cottage cheese into a bowl jams the lid on the plastic container and shoves it back into the fridge while using his other hand to pull out a carton of strawberries. He hacks these into odd-shaped pieces without hulling them. Gil knows that if his mother were making a fruit salad for his father, she'd hull the berries. His father grabs the mutilated fruit and throws it on top of the white curds of the cottage cheese. He's still on the phone, almost shouting, something about a PowerPoint presentation that isn't finished. Gil thinks his father is the smartest person he's ever met, maybe the smartest person ever, although he realizes he hasn't met enough people to prove that. Yet, his father can throw a curveball, hit a home run, run a mile in under six minutes, even at age 45, and still finish editing a document in less time than it takes most people to get online. But his mother is the one who reads The New Yorker from cover to cover. Most people only read it for the cartoons, Gilly, she tells him, but there's more to it than that. Maybe someday you'll feel the same way. It makes him sad and somehow angry that his mother isn't peering at a page of text now, but instead 
lies on her side for most of the day, staring at the wallpaper she insisted on hanging when they moved in. He wonders, but never asks, how much of that wallpaper she can actually see. He knows she's having trouble seeing things, and that's mainly why she isn't reading, but he wants her to pick up something in that stack of printed material. At least, he wants her to want to see it. Gil looks down at his homework. It might as well be Greek poetry for all he understands of the equation. Algebra had been tough, tougher than geometry or trig, but ultimately he figured out that it was a language and languages he gets. Languages can be broken down into parts and organized into systems. Calculus feels like some kind of magic. It's beautiful and mysterious, but completely opaque. He thinks about the word opaque for a moment and then about his mother's eyeballs, her eyeballs, not just her eyes. What is going on behind the lenses? What happens back at the root or whatever that part that connects the eyeballs to the brain is called? He squeezes his own eyes shut and cracks his neck, something his sister Hadley hates, but she's off babysitting for one of the endless string of majors' wives who move through every year at Command of General Staff College. Then he hears his father shout, Jesus of Christ! I told him not to rely on those information management numbskulls. Gil considers gathering up his school stuff and heading to his room, but then his father jerks his head forcefully towards the master suite, motioning with the tray that Gil needs to take it into his mother. He just likes entering his mother's sick room right now. His father has taken to sleeping on the family room sofa. The master suite is cluttered with pill bottles, laundry, towels and nightgowns, even, worst of all, a commode. But as he goes through the door with the tray and a glass of ginger ale he doesn't want to smell, he, spill, excuse me, he says, Mom? No answer. She's on her side, facing away from the door, and he has to put the tray down on her low dresser so he can walk around and see if she's still awake so he doesn't wake her up without bothering, without, so he can wake her up without bothering her. Her eyes are half shut, but when she sees him come around the foot of the bed, she smiles. Honey, thank you. Do you want me to help you sit up, Mom? He asks. She nods, and he walks back around, pulls her up, and allows her to bend for a moment while he fluffs up the pillows behind her. When she settles back, he pulls up the sheet and blankets, straightens them so the tray will lie evenly. Now it's Gil's turn to swallow hard. He doesn't want his mother to see, so he sort of swings toward the television. Want me to turn on the tube? It's time for Jeopardy. Ever since he was little, their family has loved watching the quiz show together. His parents are fearsomely competitive when it comes to any kind of knowledge-based challenge. Gil and his sister knew that on nights when their father was home at 7.30 on the dot, he and his mother would be curled up in their easy chairs waiting for Alex Trebek to read off the first round categories. They'd alternately cheer and heckle as topics appeared that one or both of them knew well. His father was quick on the draw and usually got more questions at first, but his mother always, always knew Final Jeopardy. She nods again, her mouth full of fruit. So he clicks the remote and the screen fills with the image of an answer. Homer called it wine dark. Gil hears his mother say something he can't understand, but then when she finishes chewing, she says, the sea, what is the sea? He sits down against the bed. The sea is wine dark? What are you talking about? It's from Homer, my dear, she says. There's a hint of a smile in her voice now that she's connected to something outside of her bed. It's from the Iliad. Jeopardy has moved ahead several questions, and he decides he'll spend a few more minutes alone with her. He hears her take a sip of her soda and waits for her to finish before he asks, why dark as wine? She laughs. I don't think anyone really knows. Maybe it was opaque, like a good glass of red. There's that word again, opaque. Mom, yes. Now her spoon is scraping the bowl as she eats the cottage cheese. Don't be upset. Something hits the back of his head. 
She's balled up her napkin and thrown it at him. Out with it, mister, whatever it is. He hears her breathing a little hard. She hasn't moved much lately. He decides to go ahead. Are you going to go blind? Oh, Gilly, I don't think so. That's the least of my worry, she said. I just want to make it out of this bed and stay around for a while, long enough at least to see you get into West Point or wherever. Both of them are silent. This is the first time his mother has said something about dying. The thought overwhelms him, fills up his head in some buzzing, clanging way that freezes his faith and mouth and lungs. Even if he knew what to say, he couldn't speak right now. When the feeling sort of explodes and rises, leaving him dizzy and lightheaded, he gets up and lurches for the tray. I'll go get you some tea, he says, hearing his own voice from far away. Gil, his mother calls him as he reaches the hallway. He turns, yes, mom? Maybe she'll say something, anything that will clear this haze. I think I'd rather have some hot chocolate. She is staring at the blue glow. It's time for final jeopardy. Thank you. Everyone, get your umbrellas ready. It's raining cats and dogs one final time. The first rule of events is abuse your audience with stuffed animals, just in case you're wondering. Hey, um, I think it's also time to invite Amy back to the stage for Amy's Funnies. What's it? What? <laughs> the joke's on you, Zach, because somebody took my paper with the joke, so. No, it's no. it's white. That's fine. That's fine. Somebody say something funny while I'm looking for I'm this. just going to stare at you awkwardly until and, and draw the audience's attention to you as you search for the joke. Now I'm going to take my time. <laughs> uh, we have lost... Somebody, it. all the readers should look through. Oh, there's a picture of you, Steph. What? I'm very confused now what's going on in Amy's phone. <laughs> it's not them. Those are my discards. Well, maybe we don't have Amy's funnies. We may have lost it. So you sent it, and, and now I wrote, I said that is absolutely my favorite new joke forever, and then, all right. It's really not here. Oh, no. All right. So I, I really, I sent it to my my old... Do that a little bit more, and I will find No, else. that's over. It's too, too late. We've lost the joke. Oh, man, really? <laughs> yep. I'm going to feel bad about this for days. Yeah, it's okay. What's next? Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we're, this is going to be very spontaneous, and we're going to pretend that I had this here, because I actually rehearsed it, didn't I? And whichever reader, you go home and you have a copy of this, I don't know, issue threat. Okay. A horse walks into a bar, and the bartender asks, hey, no, this isn't Parsifal. No, no. What? You... No, th no, thank you. A horse walks into a bar, and the bartender asks, hey, you want a beer? And the horse responds, I think not. And promptly disappears. Now, admittedly, this joke only makes sense if you're familiar with the French Enlightenment philosopher René Descartes, who famously said, I think, therefore I am. The horse thought not, and therefore wasn't. But if I had explained that all first, I would have been putting Descartes before the horse. It was, it was worth the struggle. It was worth the struggle. You're booing, who is booing me? Who is booing me? That was me, that was me. Oh, all right, fair, fair. Okay, that's professional, professional rivalry. Okay, 
Now what? It is Emily. All right, and whoever has my damn joke, you know, put money in the put money in the kitty over there. That's okay. I think we heard you. <laughs> well, when you couldn't find it, I was gonna say cat got your tongue, but you know. Ah. Ah. Woo. Oh, see some boo. That's why now. Emily doesn't get the diminished chord. Uh. Now we're bullying. <laughs> it's time for our last reader of the evening, Jamila Menix. You could come Woo-hoo. down to the stage. Everybody give it up for the jazz oh, man. Yeah. I know. Woo! <laughs> Jamila, hi. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. First question, you probably know it by now. Who the heck are you? So I am Jamila Minix. I am the author of Moonrise Over New Jessup. And I think most importantly, I'm a child of people who have been Alabama since before Alabama was Alabama. So my book is about black people in Alabama, and I'm just thrilled to be here. And is it available for purchase in the room next door? It just might be available for purchase in the room right next door to us. So. Wonderful. I'm sorry? Support loyalty bookstores. Yes, please support loyalty bookstores. They have been an incredible supporter of New Jessup. They are an amazing indie bookstore right here in D.C. and in, in um, Maryland. So please, please, please support them. Woo. All right. So for cliche day... What's one of your most favorite phrases? So I'm going to bring on um, two cliches of my favorites. They're straight out of Alabama. Is anybody in here from the South at all? Okay, yes, Woo. yes, yes. So these will sound familiar to you. First of all, ain't nothing new under the sun. Mm-hmm. And the second one is really one of my favorites. Um, it was when my mama, when somebody would call me a name or say something about me, and she would say, there's no reason to get upset because... Only a hit dog hollers. Mm. Ooh, those are good. Yeah, those are those really are good. good. We know how to do it in the South. <laughs> All right, and last but not least, could you recommend a book for us? All right, so we're going to keep it in the South, and I'm going to recommend Dr. Amani Perry's South to America. It's an amazing book, and she goes south, 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 all the way to South America. But it is really an exploration of how the southeastern United States is responsible for everything that we have in this great country. Wonderful. All right, I will let you get to your reading. Wonderful. Thank you. So, as I said, my book is Moonrise Over New Jessup. It follows the story of Alice Young, who is a black woman who moves to an all-black settlement in New Jessup, Alabama, 1957, where the people are thriving. They, it is a thriving community where they really question the value of integration. It's the beginning of the civil rights movement, and this is a community where the people really believe that they would thrive and have thrived in independence. So I'm going to start at the beginning, and um, I'm going to introduce you to Alice and New Jessup from the very beginning. And because I grew up hearing stories, I'm not necessarily going to read it. I'm going to, it will be the words from the book, but I'm going to tell y'all a story like I grew up hearing stories. Is that all right? The moon rises and sets, stitching eternity together, night by night. Love's spun thread binds family when even years so the blue skies stand between one and another's touch. Generations travel the same footprints, reach hands to the same climbing branches, and warm the same brown skin under the Alabama sun now. Maybe family brings to mind only blood, marital relations, and it's easy to understand that way of thinking. But love by my hands tethers generations to generations, as well as kin by skin, in this place where all in me and of me can thrive. 
But even, a, even the strongest thread will snap with constant tension and no slack. The heavens overflow with memories lost. So, as life requires, I hold taut and I give. In some ways, my people know if in some they never will. But in all ways, my moon rises and sets for family. So, in eternity, the time had come for me to leave the home where I was born. The sun was setting and the half-bald red sweet gum around the fields announced November, just a few days coming. But 1957 was still October old when my landlord ended up face down on the ground for trying to drag me behind him to the tool shed. I was the last to leave the home house in Rensselaer. Daddy had passed a couple of weeks before, and I had settled him next to Mama, though his burial left me scrambling for the rent. My sister Rosie was living in Chicago with a nice family, doing hair. My need to keep a roof over my head had mellowed my worry to wonder about when my next letter would arrive. There was plenty of gleaning left to make November's payment, and then I'd scratch around for whatever came available to buy myself some time. I had never planned or wanted to leave Alabama, but with old man Todd shouting curses at my back, his face split open, gushing sweet gum red, my plans to stay began to fade. After a night at the neighbor's and an hour's long walk with the dawn, I arrived at the bus station with just my thrown together knapsack. The man behind the counter assured me that my little money would carry me to Birmingham, not Louisville or Nashville or Cleveland, let alone Chicago. Birmingham, he said, and no further. In those hours I waited on the bus to depart, my world came undone, piece by piece. Unable to get to a place I never wanted to go. With ticket in hand to a place I knew not a single soul first. The landscape flattened. Direction was next, north, south, east, west, all headed towards the unfamiliar, and then finally color, till everything faded to black and white. I rode the bus into this flat, directionless, colorless world, till it shushed to a stop in my new home. Not that I knew it at the time. No, my ticket read Birmingham, and all I knew was that we had stopped somewhere between nowhere in particular and the big city. We'd gone 100 country miles, or maybe 10, stopped once, twice, I don't know. I was sitting by the window watching the world blur by as the man seated next to me kept up one-sided conversation about returning north after visiting with his wife and children down country. Somewhere along the way, he started worrying me about the brown paper bag in my lap and the chicken grease soaking through to my dress, but that oily stain hardly ruined anything. The gray threads had known color when I first sewed it. Red plaid, but... That stain just turned light gray to ash and ash gray to black, so somewhere near Needham, I offered him the chicken. He took it and finally left me alone. We shushed to a stop and the bus emptied, some getting off, hugging loved ones, hello, some taking luggage from the belly of the bus, and most everybody stretching, smiling, and laughing underneath this blue sky day. But the stops were all the same to me, so I stayed inside with my head against the window, feeling the sun's warmth against my cheek. And that's when a red-heeled shoe clicked its way up the sidewalk. Two of them, if I'm honest, so, but wasn't so much the shoes that caught my eye, but the bronze stockinged legs inside them. They continued up the way towards the sidewalk cafe before disappearing through the front door. My eyes traveled from that cafe to the sidewalk to a row of brick front shops lining a wide avenue. The sun gleamed from the white tile at the bus depot and a polished chrome dog leapt over the door. A couple folks 
one like me, the other nothing like me, looked around unsure what we were seeing. When the man seated next to me came back smelling the cigarettes and shoe polish, he urged me off the bus with a dime from his own pocket. Miss, this here is a good place to stretch your legs and we ain't gonna stop for another while. Why don't you go on inside and get yourself a Coca-Cola? Before stepping foot to pavement, I hovered in the doorway of that bus. To the left and the right, the avenue, the sidewalks, the storefronts, all extended to the horizon in either direction. But reaching the front door of the depot, the colored entrance was nowhere in sight. To my right, a shoeshine man chewed a toothpick and studied the shoe and his polish and his hands from every angle. Behind me, from the bus window, the man urged me through the door. Only the last thing I needed was to be arrested just for going through the front to buy a Coke. Help you, miss? Asked that shoeshine man. Till the words eased from his mouth, he'd done his level best to ignore me. <laughs> With the weather beaten hand-me-downs on my feet, it was no wonder why. I'm looking for the colored entrance, please, I said to the pavement, not wanting to be pegged ignorant of city ways and where they hid the Negro doorways. You won't find one of them here, he said. Just walk in. I'm looking for the colored entrance, please, I insisted. He seemed an unusual man, perhaps a prankster of some sort, with the long limbs, triangular head, and bulging eyes of a chameleon, just the sort to make trouble for folks and then dart away. We ain't got one of them, because ain't nothing but Negroes in this town, is what I'm telling you. Look around and see if you see any white folks other than these sorry few from the buses. He smirked and returned his attention to the shoe in his hand, satisfied he knew the lay of the land. A dark brown man sold bus tickets and answered questions inside, while two soldiers, an army issue khaki, rushed past me, one with a deep mulberry skin of the ready harvest, and the other, my same sun gold cinnamon with dark freckles on his cheeks who placed a hand to his peak cap. A light-skinned woman with a wild mane of bottle red hair rushed into a yellow cab driven by a portly man of pecan complexion. He sped past an ebony police officer holding white gloved palms up, meaning stop. Across the street, a deep bronze man wore pink covered overalls, and he was smoking a cigarette next to another bib overalled man, Coco Brown. And the family by the drink machine, well, the mama, she was high yellow. But the daddy was a rich, deep brown to match some good, peaty soil. One child favored him, one her, and one fell to a brown somewhere in the middle, and that was just within those few feet of me at the depot. Up and down the avenue, Negroes of every shade came together like the dusk in a fall forest. I should have been glad, relieved to find such a sight on my journey, but my knees gave out and I sank onto the bench next to that shoeshine man. I buried my face in my hands and sobbed. Ain't our folks' usual reaction when they first arrive in New Jessup, he said, patting my shoulder with the light taps of a man unaccustomed to comforting people. <laughs> I stopped crying in time to wave the bus off, too exhausted to shed another drop. Is there a church house nearby, I asked. Pastor Mrs. Brown will take right good care of you up in Morning Star Baptist, he said, and with walking directions, he sent me on my way. After I made it a couple steps up the sidewalk, he called out. When I turned, he spoke to the stain on my dress and the marks on my arm that weariness had me forgetting to hide. But miss, if you're looking for white folks, and I don't imagine that you would be, but say you are, well, you'd have to get all the way to the other side of the woods to find a single one. And I'll stop there. Uh, 
I don't want to follow. I don't want to follow that. Me neither. So, um, so we are we are going to wrap up, and I'm going to wrap up. Um, I'm going to offer two special thanks. One to um, that guy there, the Writer Center Orchestra. Um, Zach, Zach, the bee's knees, the cat's pajamas, the cream of the crop. And, Okay, we're done with you. And also, I you a major chord. Thank you. Yeah. Brains behind this, the man behind the curtain for for the Writer Center Live. Um, so, Zach Powers, everyone. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was that was too much too much praise. Um, and, and also to uh, to the, the, the big kahuna, uh, the, our boss, Margaret Melanie, for letting us actually do this for a living. And now I'll hand over to Emily, who didn't lose her script. Still got it, still got it. Um, another big round of applause for all of our readers. If we could have you all join us up front. <laughs> Jamila, Bethan, Claude, Shannon. Come forward, readers. Come on. Get the now. readers, get the staff. Come Ariel, come on up, get the Ariel, staff. Ariel, Margaret, Lacey. We're going to do a big, Steph. like, Saturday Night Live style. This is just a Jessen. photo op. Where's the camera? Is someone taking a picture? Because we got it going on. in the back. No. Okay, okay, we got Steph. Thank you, Steph. All right, everybody, big dating game goodbye. Say Hello. cheese. Say cheese, say cheese. There we go. Say cheese. Thank you also to Stephanie Grimm. Stephanie Grimm, lighting extraordinaire, <laughs> camera, camera operator. Thanks to Manny and Laura, other Writer Center staff who were not here this the evening. The board. The board. Thank you all for being here, participating. You're all winners. Most of you. And please, please, please buy books. Eat, books, drink, books, buy books, books, books. Give, give money. Um, and hang out. You don't have a tip jar. You don't have a tip jar. I don't. Throw your hat down. No. Hey, throw your hat in the ring. Okay, goodbye. Ah, Bye. last one.